Okay, we are, it's going to be a different message. We're not in Isaiah for one thing, as I mentioned this morning. Um, and for most of the message, to be honest, we're not going to be in the Bible, so excuse me for that. If you throw stones at me, I'll try to duck or hide behind this <laughs> solidly made pulpit here. But um, we're going to start in the Bible and finish in the Bible, but put some things in between there. And uh, hopefully it'll be interesting or encouraging or something to each of us. Um, if you want to turn your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 is where we'll start at in a few moments. We often have had uh, understanding the times studies where some biblical topic or cultural topic or event, uh, we present what the Bible uh, says about those things. And tonight we're not going to do uh, understanding the times, but understanding our times. So looking at uh, Open Door Baptist Church and some of our history. Um, Brenda and I came here, our first Sunday was November 8th of 1987, so it'll be 35 years here in a week or two. And I was thinking about that and thinking about, you know, being here and what's gone on since we've been here, and so I thought I'd present some of that uh, tonight. So it's kind of a bit of reminiscing, I guess, but also want to encourage each of us about what our church has been like and uh, challenge us about what our church should be like as we continue on into the future. There we go. Uh, and these two pictures are kind of a then and now type. Um, the now one I actually took this morning, so that's pretty current. <laughs> um, the other one I took, or I, don't if I, I don't even know if I took it, but it was way back when. You can see in the very back uh, the parsonage, so it was after we had moved into that parsonage. And that was built when I think our oldest son was three, I believe. So this has been early 90s, more than likely, when this other picture was taken. But that's kind of how the church, is, uh, church looked like as far as facilities. And uh, currently, we'll look at that a little bit more again. Again, we came here 35 years ago. Here's a picture of what I looked like way back then. That's, that's me. <laughs> so that was uh, actually my first day of kindergarten, not my first day of pastoring, but close enough. Um, five years old, actually four years old, yeah. Actually, I had red hair when I was really young and uh, changed a few times, getting gray now. But um, this picture here, Brent and I uh, candidated in September of 1987. And the family that we stayed with, well, now we stay with, we ate Sunday dinner with, uh, Pat and Elfrida Ewart. So you've, many of you have met the Ewarts. They uh, hosted us for dinner that Sunday after the morning service and then took us to Jerome. So our first day up in this area, uh, we spent a little bit of time in Jerome, Arizona, across over the hill. And this picture was taken pretty much on top. You can kind of see in the background there, I mean, not the cities, but you can see it's uh, up, up high. And this picture was taken up there, again, uh, the day we candidated. So before we actually became pastor and wife, uh, this picture was uh, from that weekend. This is a little more current, even though it's about a year old, I guess, uh, and Mount Vernon, so uh, George Washington's house. We were at this picture last year. We came here with no kids, and uh, we've added a little bit. Um, boy, girl, boy, Tim, Rachel, and Ben. And then today is actually Clark's birthday, our oldest grandchild in the picture there. He's nine years old today. And Calvin, the younger one, is five. And pretty soon we'll be adding a member to the family. Rachel got engaged a couple of months ago, so we're happy about that. And uh, her fiance is named Nate, Nate Sheets. And so they'll be getting married here in uh, due time, but uh, they're excited. We're excited for them as well. So looking forward to adding uh, Nate into the family. And so that's our family from uh, the last 35 years. Uh, but we're not here to talk about family so much. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, the Lord and the church. And uh, so we're going to look at uh, the outlines that you have there. We're going to start on uh, Revelation 2 and 3, but looking at the seven churches that uh, the Lord had John write letters to. 
Um, seven churches all living in the same area, all or existing in the same area, all existing at the same time in history. So uh, these are not necessarily, you know, stages of church history, you know, for the last 2,000 years. They can be viewed that way, but I think you probably have to fudge a little bit to get that completely to, to fit. But these, uh, these churches uh, give to us kind of some encouraging, encouraging words, also some warnings. Churches, based on these seven churches, face many internal dangers. And that's where we're going to start at. No church is guaranteed existence. Uh, the church as a whole is, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, Jesus said, before he even established the church. But that doesn't mean every local individual church will never pass away. These seven churches that uh, John wrote to, none of them, as far as we know, those specific churches are in existence today. There may be churches in those communities today, but doubtfully that they are the same seven churches that were existing 2,000 years ago. But these churches are, for us, good examples of uh, what to do or what not to do. And we're going to start just kind of go verse by verse or church by church and look at a uh, word of warning or uh, encouragement from them. Church at Ephesus was greatly uh, blessed by the Lord, greatly used by the Lord. Established by the Apostle Paul, as you know, from the book of Acts, had another letter written to it by the Apostle Paul. Um, but this church had one problem. Ephesians chapter, probably Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And so I've labeled it, they abandoned their love for the Lord. Some may quibble that the first love is not your love for the Lord. Might, some say it's love for one another, something to that effect. But uh, when the Bible speaks of your first love, it's not going to say first in time, but the word first can mean the most important. I think that's the issue here. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Our love for the Lord should be our primary love. We love him, we'll love other people as well. Church at Ephesus abandoned it. They left their first love, and they were rebuked for that. They were a good church in other ways, doctrinally, and in terms of their service and ministries. But in terms of their love for the Lord, they allowed that to, to leave. They abandoned it and left their first love. So that's one danger. The church could stop loving the Lord. And from that, the warning there, verse 5, if you don't repent, I will remove your candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Uh, so this church was warned, you will not exist as a light for the Lord, at least, maybe as a building and people, but in terms of as a light for the Lord, a candlestick, they would not exist if they did not repent of that lack of love for the Lord. That's one danger. Church at Pergamos replaced God's doctrine with man's doctrine. They replaced God's doctrine with man's doctrine. Look at verses 14 and 15 in chapter 2. Again, the Lord commends this church. They have some faithful people there. But verse 14, But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. They had man's doctrine, doctrine Balaam, doctrine Nicolaitans. And what those specific doctrines are is not our purpose for tonight, but just the point is that they, instead of staying true to the word of God and the biblical doctrines, God's doctrine, they brought in doctrines of men. Balaam from the Old Testament, his false teaching there. Nicolaitans are probably some uh, people at that time living and teaching something, and they were teaching that in the church at Pergamos. And the Lord challenged them about that. You shouldn't have that type of thing taking place. Replacing man's or God's doctrine with man's doctrine. There's a danger, and there's a prevalence of it, but a danger in adopting doctrines named after people. Um, we mentioned this 
not too long ago, Calvinism and Arminianism for one example, John Calvin, Jacob Arminius, naming, you know, I'm a Calvinist or so I'm an Arminian, and you're following a, a man's doctrine, and that's always dangerous because men make mistakes. Men are imperfect. We need to stay true to the Bible and just, I, I believe in what the Bible says, and then defend that and teach that. Don't say I believe the Bible because everybody might say that, but here's what I believe about the Bible instead of I'm a follower of this man or that man. Church of Pergamos did that wrong, wrongly. Church of Thyatira tolerated false teaching. They tolerated false teaching. Revelation 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, again, after commending the church for some things, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, thou allow, thou tolerate, that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So in this case, it wasn't the whole church advocating some doctrine, the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam, etc., but the church allowing something they evidently knew as a false teacher, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, calls herself a prophet, to teach this errors, these errors. And the Lord corrects or confronts the church at Thyatira for that, allowing things. Churches can be undone by what they do actively. They can also be undone by what they allow to be done as a church within their church family. That's the warning from Thyatira. The church at Sardis was led by a majority to spiritual death. Led by a majority. And I found my first typo. <laughs> yeah, it's not verse 44. No, it's not that many. Um, as chapter 3, verse 1, speaks to the church at Sardis. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven, seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. So here's a church that, by all outward human standards, was a live church. There's actors, people there, etc. But the head of the church says it's a dead church. Your name is, your reputation is, you're alive. God says, or Jesus says, you're dead. How that happened? Let's continue reading the next couple of verses. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. The church is progressively, or maybe slowly perhaps, but progressively dying. You're spiritually dead in some ways. Other parts of the church that were still true were dying, getting ready to die. Remember, therefore, how thou hast re received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy." The majority said, whatever it is that's killing the church, let's do that. There were a few names, verse 4 says, that opposed that, that were still staying true to the Lord. Thou hast a few names that have not defiled their garments. But the majority of the church led it to spiritual death. Again, whatever the specifics were that they were doing wrongly, the Bible doesn't tell us, and we don't need to know the specifics. It's enough to know that they looked good from the outward perspective, maybe large church, maybe people attending every week, etc. But the Lord said it's dead, and it became dead because the majority led it in that direction. Just a few names had not gone that way. Laodicea was self, became self-sufficient. Self-sufficient. Verse chapter 3 still, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would, 
I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They were self-sufficient. They didn't need the Lord. Down to verse 20, the Lord standing outside knocking on the door. The church had excluded Jesus from the church. We don't need him. We've got money. We've got goods. We have need of nothing. And essentially, we have need of no one. We don't even need Jesus. And the Lord says, based on all of that, um, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, even though they thought they were good. Those last two churches, Sardis and Laodicea, are probably somewhat similar. They both were viewed by other people as good, solid, strong, active, whatever churches. But one church was dead, and the other one was, we don't need the Lord. We are self-sufficient. We, are, we need nothing, in fact. Those are five internal dangers that churches faced 2,000 years ago and that churches face today. A heart for God, staying true to God's word or not, uh, replacing his doctrine with others, allowing false teachings to come in, and saying we don't even need the Lord anymore. But there were two churches that were different from those five. Two churches that the Lord didn't say, I have something against you. Those are the churches at Smyrna and Philadelphia. They're the ones that we should try to be like. And those two churches have something in common. They are described as being faithful in terms of the church at Smyrna and enduring the church at Philadelphia. And those words, they're not identical, but they really go together in terms of the Lord's work in a, in a church. A church that is faithful will endure. A church that is enduring is faithful to the Lord. Uh, that's what we can learn from these two churches. Smyrna, chapter 2, and verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And I know that is a command to the church, be thou faithful. But the implication is that they have been, they, and the Lord does expect them to continue to be faithful. Look at verse 9, what he says about them. I know thy works, thy tribulation, poverty, but thou art rich, physically, materially poor, unlike Laodicea, but spiritually rich, again, unlike Laodicea. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Those are the ones that will essentially oppose and persecute Smyrna. But you continue being faithful. You've been faithful so far. Keep being faithful unto death. Even if you are put to death, you're going to be in prison, but even if you're put to death, just stay faithful to the Lord, he said. Be a faithful church. Philadelphia, very similar. Chapter 3 and verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the earth, come upon the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. That word patience is commonly translated by the word endure or endurance. And that's really the better understanding. It's not waiting for something, but enduring through something is what that word means. Because you have endured, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. Smyrna was faithful. Philadelphia was enduring. And those two attributes of a church are highly commendable in these chapters, but those characteristics of believers are commended throughout the scriptures. And that's what I would uh, hope that o Open Door Baptist Church has been and will continue to be faithful to the Lord, enduring through good times and bads, and we'll con bad, singular, and we'll continue being faithful to the Lord and enduring through good times and bad. That is, should be our goal as well as should have been our history. And so that's a, that opening part 
uh, opening point, excuse me, kind of a word of warning, what to avoid, those, the examples of those five churches, but hopefully a word of encouragement. Be faithful, be enduring as believers and as a church. Now, what about our history? Where, where have we been? What have we been? Blessed, a blessed church through the years. ODBC, Open Door Baptist Church, in case that's not clear, I should have spelled that out, but Open Door has been a blessed church through the years, blessed by God. Um, you probably know this, but Open Door is the first church in Prescott Valley. I think it's on the back of our bulletins every Sunday. It states that, but started in 1969, um, 53 years ago now, September of 1969, and God has blessed this church in, in many ways. We have seen souls saved and discipled throughout the years. Souls saved and discipled. That is what a church should be doing. That is what uh, individual believers should be involved with. Sharing the gospel with people, teaching them the word of God. We don't have discipleship classes per se where you know, we segment off a group of people for an hour and call it discipleship class. That's become a, a popular thing lately. But what's discipleship? It is teaching people to be followers of Christ. We do that in Sunday school, 9 o'clock. We do that Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. We do that Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock or 6 o'clock previously. We do that in ladies' Bible study. We do that in Awana. We do that in prayer meeting. We do it in youth group. We teach the Word of God, help people become knowledgeable of the Word of God so that they can be faithful followers of the Word of God. So we don't have a discipleship class per se, but we preach the gospel so souls get saved and we teach the Word of God so believers can be discipled. And that's what churches should be doing. Um, we would all wish that there were more people being saved, more people growing in the Lord, but as a church family, we've been doing these things faithfully for 50 plus years. I'm kind of focused on the last 35 years, but throughout our history, God has blessed the word of God here through uh, souls being saved and believers being discipled or taught. We have seen the beginning and end of some ministries. And in that, there's been Kind of by that phrase, beginning and end, you can say that there's good news in there and there's bad news in there, good and sad at least. Um, we haven't stayed the same, in other words. We've, as a church, we've done things that we weren't doing before, and some of those things that we started have stopped, been replaced by other things. But some ministries began and some ended. This is a, a picture of a sad thing. Um, we came here in 1987. That fall, November, we were in the state association at the time. The state association voted to establish a camp called Camp Tishomingo. Uh, there had been a camp before that in the state, and then it kind of fell apart, and they reestablished a camping ministry, and they gave that name Camp Tishomingo. Tishomingo is a Cherokee word meaning servant of the king. And this was a Wonderful camp. It met in different locations. Um, when we first, uh, well, when a church, the camp first was established in 1987, the following summer, 88, um, it met at property in Christopher Creek. 50 some acres, beautiful ponderosa pine, just beautiful property. Didn't charge a dime uh, to be there. Some man, businessman in Phoenix owned it. And uh, not a member of a church, he just, agreed to let us use the property. Some years later, he wanted to uh, kind of incorporate it. And so he charged us a dollar a year for, I think it's set 14, two seven year contracts, so 14 years, a dollar a year to rent 50 plus acres of beautiful land. It's just a great place to be. He wound up selling that land, so we moved to a camp in Burton, uh, Arizona near Sholo. And then in the whole process, we were looking to buy our own land, and we ultimately bought this land here um, in Concho, which is near Sholo as well, Arizona. Built this building. If you know Warren and Laura Lee Rushton, Warren designed this building, drew up the plans for it. 
mostly volunteer labor building it. Uh, so that ministry began. And then two years after we built this building and had two summers of camp there, uh, they voted to sell the camp and close the camp and sell the property. And financially it benefited the church. We got money sitting in the bank somewhere, but much would rather would be having camp than you know, having money in the bank. But this is a ministry that began and ended you know, from 1988 through about 2017 or 18 at Ballpark. Puerto Abierto is another one. I uh, started that, it's Spanish ministry. Puerto Abierto means open door. And we started that in February of 2013. And uh, met every Sunday afternoon, 2.30 in the afternoon, most, most Sunday afternoons. And uh, it was going well. At one point we had 20 some people coming. And then, uh, I don't know, how do I kindly describe this man? <laughs> um, he was a missionary and a pastor. He and his family was coming to the church here, at, or the Puerto Abierta, spoke Spanish fluently, and started Spanish churches, different places, I guess. And I thought he might be a good uh, man to take over, so I wouldn't have to be doing this. So if somebody speaking Spanish, he could take that ministry. And uh, he, we met with him, the deacons, I don't think any of the men here were deacons at that time, but the deacons and myself met with him and he wanted to take it you know, musically and in other ways take it differently than what we have established it as. And we said, no, thank you. We don't want to change and have a, you know, rock music in our churches, church here. And so not only did he leave and his family left, that, that was the last Sunday there, um, but he contacted every other family coming to the church, or to Puerto Abierta, said, I'm going to be starting a church in my house next Sunday, and about half the people left. There were only two families stayed here. So from 20-some people down to eight or so overnight. Well, no questions. Maybe later we'll do that, yeah. And uh, so that was the end of, well, that wasn't the end of Puerto Abierta, but uh, kind of the beginning of the end. We kept meeting those couple families, and down to one family, and we stopped it. Uh, it's either early this year or late last year. I can't remember now, but... Um, but anyways, that's another ministry that began and ended. So we still care for Hispanic-speaking Spanish speaking people. We still have some Hispanics come to uh, Juan and the like. Hopefully they'll come back. They're in football right now. But uh, that specific ministry uh, began and ended after about eight or nine years, I guess it was. But um, we've seen ministries begin and end you know, through the years here. And others, too. We have Juan and now. One is the third kids ministry we've had uh, since we've been here. Uh, we started something, Sunbeams it was called, and it was just a, something we developed ourselves, just Bible time, snack, game, that sort of thing. We had Patch the Pirate for uh, I think one year, if I remember correct, maybe two years, and that was just didn't work well, so we've been with Awana for the last uh, 25 to 30 years now. Much better ministry. Page two, we've seen young men enter into the full-time ministry. Um, three young men, some of, two of them attended here as young people. Uh, the other one didn't and attend as a young person, but joined the church as an adult. Um, Dan Mapes, that's what I'm speaking of. He was ordained here probably 20-some years ago. Uh, Dan and Kara, still members of the church, are the missionaries to Ghana. Uh, they just returned to Ghana yesterday, at least they were scheduled to. I assume they made that flight. And uh, so, but we ordained him. Um, young man named Sam Sinclair. He, if you remember about a year, maybe a year and a half ago, I went to Alabama for an ordination, and that was for this a young man named Sam Sinclair. Yeah, Carol would know him very well, the Sinclair family, good, good family. And then before that, a young man named Matt Claridge. And uh, he was part of our church as a young person. And he's pastoring up in uh, Idaho right now. So um, uh, he was ordained here. And so was um, Dan, as I mentioned, Dan Mapes. Sam was ordained, of course, in Alabama, I just mentioned. We see young men enter into the full-time ministry. Others have gone to Bible colleges and the like, but those three men are pastoring or missionaries today. 
increased our mission support. Um, I'm very thankful for this. When we first came here, the church was giving 10% of the general fund offerings. Um, so like if for every $1,000 that comes into the general fund, $100 of that goes directly into missions. That was how it started, or what it was when we first came here. And currently, instead of $100 going, $250 goes to missions out of every $1,000. And you see the missions that we supported in the back, we're gonna vote on adding uh, additional ones here, or replacing uh, soon. Um, but that is good, God has allowed us to live, if you will, off of 75% of our offerings. We don't have a big, we don't have a lot of expenses. We pay the light bill, that sort of thing. We don't have major expenses so that we can send 25% of our offerings to missionaries overseas or elsewhere in our country. And that's, that's a good thing, be able to support to that level missions. And this has always been the case, and you are part of that. We have wonderful people who worship and serve here. God has blessed us with good people, faithful people, friendly people, people true to the Word of God and who want the Word of God uh, taught here. Um, this, God has always given us a good church here, and we're very grateful for that. I've got a couple of pictures of some previous ones. This is... Um, the only time in the history of the world <laughs> where this group of people were together, um, these are the five men and their wives who have served as pastors here at Open Door Baptist Church. In 1989, um, so we've been here almost two years, September 1989, when the church had its 20th anniversary, and myself and the other four previous pastors were all able to be back here for that anniversary, and all four uh, spoke at it. Just to, I'm going to use this for a moment, but just to point out, that's not a very clear picture, but that there, Bob and Dottie Cooley, their picture's on the top left corner back there as well. Cooley Hall next door. They, the missionaries from Baptist Men Missions who started Open Door Baptist Church. You know those two people. <laughs> um, after Bob and Dottie, this couple on the left here, uh, Gene and Marilyn McIntosh, came here in 1977. Pastor Cooley was here from 69 through 77. Uh, Gene and Marilyn McIntosh on the left, your left, um, from 77 through, I think, 85, I remember, right, or 84, 85. And they just retired recently. They lived down in, I think, Sun City, but somewhere down in the valley. They left here, pastoring a church in Phoenix, and then pastoring up in Cedarville, Illinois, I think it was called, if I remember correctly. And, but then, like I said, recently retired down to Phoenix. Um, they were followed by this couple in the middle. Uh, their name is our Larry and Peggy McMillan. And they were here just for give or take a year, maybe a couple months more or less than a year. And then the Lord directed his steps to be a, an attorney. So he left the church, went to law school, I think at NAU. And last I knew he was practicing law up in the Indianapolis area. He may be retired now, he's a few years older than we are. Um, but they were here for a short time. And then next to them, oops, right there, um, Swanson, Leonard and Marilyn Swanson. And they're the ones who preceded us. They were here for just about a year as well. He had been a pastor before, retired, and then there's a need here for a pastor. He was, he was uh, retired and attending a church in Mesa and heard about the church here, applied for it, whatever, and was called here. And he passed it for, again, either a little more or a little less than a year. And they retired again. And then the, uh, the church called, uh, called Brenda and I to, be, to come here. So those are the five pastors of the church throughout the history. Um, the two on the, the end were here for a total of about 14 or 15 years. The two in the middle were here for about two years total. And then you know, we've been here. This group here... <laughs> Um, you might recognize a few of those. One of them, Pastor Bob down there, you just saw his picture, the founding pastor of the church. I think this was taken for a church directory, a group of just, I think it was the men's prayer bar, something like that, a representative of that. But for these men here, 
were deacons when uh, the Lord called us here. So that's why I included this picture. This gentleman here, Richard Paddy, um, was the chairman of the deacons when he first came here. He was at Pearl Harbor when it got bombed. He went to World War II, went to Korea, uh, Vietnam, and then got out of the military, the Navy, survived all that as an unsaved man. Praise the Lord for that, got saved, and was baptized, not in this building, because we didn't have a baptistry at that time, but church in Prescott, and uh, was the chairman of the deacon when we came here. You might recognize him, uh, Paul Tolkien. Uh, he was piano player and pianist here, or organist here uh, for many years. I'll never forget the first Sunday I was here as pastor. He was the Sunday school teacher in the adult class. I was sitting about where Brenda is now. And before the class began, Paul stood up and said, Pastor, would you lead us in prayer? And I'm sitting with my head bowed, waiting for the pastor to, to pray, and forgot that I was the pastor at that time, <laughs> my first Sunday as a pastor. But um, Paul still lives here in Prescott Valley, just a mile or so here, and he's, he's visited occasionally, and, and is still a good, good guy and good friend. There's Pat Ewart, if you've, I mentioned him a little bit ago, took us up on the, uh, to Jerome that first Sunday, but uh, Pat, Pray for him. Linda mentioned this morning that he and Alfreda aren't doing very well uh, uh, mentally and physically, so be praying for her. They're both 90, 91, something like that. Uh, Jan Gertner, right in the middle there. Many of you may have met him, Jan and Joyce. Uh, he was both those two men, all three of those, Paul, Pat, and Jan were deacons when I came here. And, uh, and Jan and Joyce still live locally, occasionally visit here, but good, good folks as well. Uh, here in Prescott Valley. That man there is, he's in glory, as is Pastor Bob. Uh, his name is Luke Krepsick, uh, the one in the gray suit back there. But, but uh, good men, deacons, for the most part, four of those men. Pastor Bob was a deacon another time as well. And it's good men, and God has given us good deacons. And we have several here this, this evening. Appreciate uh, Pastor, the current uh, uh, chairman of the deacons. Wayne's currently deacon, Daniel's been a deacon, and a good, good men that have served and still are serving as deacons. But the Lord has always given us good people. We've never been a gigantic church. We've always had good people, always had loving people, and people who love the Lord and love the Bible as well. And can't ask for much more than that. I'm very blessed for that. All right, number three, changes through the years. Um, I mentioned a little bit in terms of the uh, ministries that have changed, but some other things. There have been facility changes. That initial picture that I, on the front screen, the outside of the two buildings, kind of indicated that. Uh, we remodeled and added on to the buildings a little bit uh, through the years. Um, we didn't have, where my office is, we didn't have that when we first came in. My office was the Cubbies room where uh, uh, Dixie teaches Cubbies. That was my office back in the day. Uh, we added a wing on, uh, Warren Rushton drew that up as well. Uh, we added Hannah's Hard on, the nursery at the front of the building next door. Uh, did a little remodeling inside here. Um, here's another picture of the outside from a different angle. Um, ladies hated that parking lot because they wear high heel shoes and those rocks would just scratch off the whatever's on the heel down there, and they just hated that. And uh, that's what the buildings look like. Uh, this church, this facility here, was built in 73, I believe, it was the first uh, when it was uh, built, first Sunday of January 74. The building next door in 1983, so about 10 years later, that one was, was built. Um, Cooley Hall, it wasn't called Cooley Hall until 10 or so years ago. Um, but that's the original, or the facilities when we first came here. This is a view a little bit of the inside. Of, again, this is the late 80s. <laughs> dark brown paneling on the walls. This would be that corner there. Uh, dark brown paneling. Most uncomfortable pews you've ever been in, if you were blessed to sit in those. Um, the backs were, I know these aren't the most comfortable, but if you were sitting in those and then sitting in these ones here, you'd say praise the Lord for, for these. Uh, no padding on the back at all of these ones. And the padding on the seats were just hardly there. And uh, 
but that's and it kind of a almost orangey color carpet. The window blinds, those weren't when we first got here, something else, kind of like kitchen blinds almost, but somebody replaced those at some point, replaced those several times through the years. But um, one little set of kids here, you can't really see them too well, it's because it's not the best picture again, but that little girl there, and then her brother, I think it's one of these two here, but um, that girl there is named Stacy, or Tracy Stiegel, and her little brother, Timmy, and their dad, I saw in the paper just this last week, is, uh, their dad uh, just passed away just a few days ago. Uh, he was age 64. And those kids still live in town. See him, Brent and I were just talking about that the other day. We still see these couple of kids every now and then, Timmy and Tracy Stiegel. But uh, that's what the church looked like on the inside, this building looked like back in the day. But that's changed. We built a parsonage. I, Showed you the original picture way on the front screen again, the parsonage way at the far end. We actually built a parsonage twice. <laughs> um, not too many churches can say that, so we're unique almost in that regard. Here's a view of the original parsonage. Um, when we first were coming here, they had sent us a letter and they had $8,000 set aside to build a parsonage back you know, 1987, and uh, so they're in process saving towards that. And um, Tim was born in 1988, so about a year after we were here, not quite a year. And we moved in here, I think he was three, is that correct? So 91? Year and a half. Year and a half. Oh, so much for, so uh, 1990, I guess that would have been. Okay. And uh, um, so that was the original church, or parsonage, excuse me, the cost of that house was $45,000. We took out a small loan uh, to pay for it, paid it off in, you know, I don't know, 10 years or whatever it might have been back then, and we paid extra to get it paid off, um, but, you know, 45000 <laughs> that same house probably cost a quarter million or 200000 whatever to build today. That was... The result of my cooking on one particular day, and so that's that's the kitchen. So we don't cook anymore, at least I don't. Um, and that's this is now what the house looks like today because we live there now. <laughs> but before we moved in, this is what it uh, looked like. And yeah, God bless the good uh, replacement for the parsonage. We're blessed to have that. And it's paid off. We paid off the original parsonage, and then this one with the insurance money from that that burnt. Uh, we built this one without having to take out a loan at all. Um, we are debt free, and praise the Lord for that. Um, that's why we're able to spend 25% on missions. Um, a lot of churches, especially small churches, they're either renting a facility or they're still paying for their buildings. And therefore, you know, a big chunk, especially for a small church, a big percentage goes towards rent, mortgage, something like that. And thankfully, we don't have any debt at all. And uh, that's, we had a burning, mortgage burning. I forgot how many years ago this would have been. That gentleman there is Mark Sinclair. I mentioned his, da his son, Sam, is the pastor in uh, Alabama. And uh, we've been debt free. We had to take out a small loan when we added on to the, where my office now is, that wing over there. We thought we had enough money, about $100,000 saved up, but then we didn't know we had to add uh, the smoke alarm system and something else. It was just costing more than we knew about. So we took out, I think, about $10,000 loan, and that's been paid off. So, so thank the Lord we are a debt-free facility. Ministry changes, and I mentioned uh, some that have started and ended, um, but they're just different things that we have done differently, um, either adding or changing with children, with uh, adults. I appreciate what Dan does, uh, the creation class he's recently had, and then the evangelism class that, that's been going on and, and the witnessing at the park, that's very recent uh, ministry, but others as well that the church has been involved in uh, through the years. And, uh, I don't want to spend more time on that, but, but um, change some of the things we, we do as a church, ministry-wise. 
It's been one doctrinal change, and uh, not, not everybody agrees with this, and, but uh, I'm longing for different views on the rapture. And there was a testy time, or a, uh, not testy, but a difficult time, I guess, for a little bit. But, but uh, there's more important doctrines that churches is, don't agree on that they still stay together. This is not the most important doctrine. And so even though we changed our doctrinal position, and that's the only time in 50 years, 50 plus years, the church has changed its doctrinal statement, We've changed bylaws, things like that, but not our doctrine except for this, this one point here. Interruptions in some relationships. And these are always hard, no matter what the cause of the interruption is. Uh, sometimes been through death and sometimes through departures. Um, some people have left the church for different reasons. Some moving away is nothing personal about that. We still miss them. They've moved to other parts of the state or country. Others still local, but left the church and for whatever reasons. And still friendly relationships with many of many folks, but uh, it's still hard when somebody leaves the church. Uh, we've had that. And then through death, uh, many. I, Back in the room behind where Jim and Dixie are, I don't know if you ever go back there or not, but there's a kind of similar shape and size to this little table. And this is just a memorial book that sits back in there and, and um, lists most of the people that have passed away since the church started, that we had a record of anyways. Uh, the first one in the book is back in 1975. Um, somewhere in here there's, yeah, right? Uh, where was it? I don't see it now, but soon before we got here, there's four people, members of the church, at least attenders, I don't know if they were members, but they were driving on Highway 69 coming from Dewey when it was just a two-lane road at the time. And this night they'd gone out to eat, I think at the country club. There used to be a restaurant in the front over there. Driving back and parked on the side of the road was a semi-truck. It just parked there overnight or whatever. Driver didn't see it and crashed into it. All four people died just like that back in the probably the early 80s, maybe the late 70s. And uh, that would have been obviously a very hard time for the church. This is before we got here. I went through this book. Now, this is where we came, November of 1987. From there to the end, the most recent one was Martha Jones. Uh, passed away April 17th. One before that was Amy Larson, uh, Linda Goodwin's daughter. She was a little girl here at church years ago as a child. Passed away in April of this year. Uh, the one before that, Dale Burt and Wanda's husband, uh, March of this year. Right before that, uh, passed to be March 2nd of this year. Anyways, from November of 87 to now, uh, 90 names have been added to this book. Uh, passed away. Not all of them still here. Some of them moved away or something like that. Um, Warren Rushton, his previous name as well, he moved down to Phoenix a few years ago. And I went back and looked at those 90 names, and out of those 90, 60, by the best of my recollection, 63 of them I'd done the funerals for. So basically two a year, just about. Three a year in terms of people passing away. And uh, funerals are... A blessing and a hardship. I mean, praise the Lord for the person being in heaven, um, but the hardship of losing or saying goodbye to somebody, knowing you're not going to see them until they get to heaven again. Open Door Baptist Church has been very consistent through the years. There have been some changes, as you mentioned, changes in people, changes in some ministries, various changes, but in other things, very important things, we've, we've been the same. Size of the church, been very consistent since we've been here and even before we were here, but the biggest the church has ever been is about 100 people. It's been a little smaller than, you know, about 30 to 40 sometimes, but the basic between those numbers, 30 to 100 throughout its history. And for whatever reason, just hasn't grown bigger and it hasn't died either, praise the Lord for that. Um, some small churches don't survive. Um, but we're still about the same. They've been increases and decreases in the attendance. Um, they said it's gone up and it's gone down. It's gone up, it's gone down. I was watching 
uh, just this afternoon, actually, a service of a church, large church, uh, but their building is almost, well, not almost empty, but for the size of their building, it's very empty. Um, COVID did a lot to a lot of churches that people just learned to stay home and got in that habit watching on TV or whatever. But uh, we've gone up and down as probably pretty much every church has. We've been consistent in the name of the church. And some might say, so what? I say, I'm thankful. Um, at some point after we came, I don't know when it would have been, uh, but it became popular to drop the name Baptist from Baptist churches. We don't want to be identified as a Baptist church. They say there's some wackos who are Baptists. Everybody always mentions this church in Wichita, Kansas. I forgot the name of the church now, but they protest at funerals of uh, soldiers, that sort of thing. As if the whole world knows that church and judges all churches by that. And because of a church, you know, a thousand miles away from us, let's change our name. It's ridiculous. The word Baptist means a lot. It tells a lot about a church's history, what a church believes, what you can expect in the church. Uh, not every Baptist church is the same. There's, there's uh, boundaries that the Baptist churches have stayed within for the most part. And dropping that word is not necessary and often leads to other changes. Thank the Lord we haven't changed our name. It consists in the Bible versions used. Um, we had a hard business meeting. I forgot how many years ago this would have been now. And lost a lot of people um, over Bible versions. And the end result, the church voted to, from the pulpit, anybody in the pews can take whatever version they want, but the pulpit, teaching ministries, King James and New King James are the two versions that we use publicly. But that was a hard uh, business meeting, very Sneaky, unfortunately, things took place that day. But this was interesting. Since 1980, so since the day I came here, new translations and versions of the Bible in English language, not you know the different languages of the world, 39 different versions in English. Um, and these are just the ones that would be, there's several additional to this that are Catholic versions or... Messianic Jewish versions or something like that, something that we would never not touch probably. But out of those that are accepted in, uh, you know, by conservative Christians, 39 different versions. And imagine, I mean, I got so many friends that this year they're using this version, another one comes out and they switch. I like this one better. And it's on and on and on and on. Here's a list, not all of them, this is like 20 or whatever, of some of the more familiar ones that have been added in the last 35 years. Uh, the New Revised Standard, the New International Version has added like two or three different ones. The Inclusive, remember the Inclusive Language Bible? Um, taking the fatherhood of God away, and the, you know, God as father, mother, instead of God as our father, et cetera. Um, so many different things, and I'm not dead yet, but until I die, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be using the King James Version. I, I love it. I think it's a great version. It's not perfect, I guess. No version is perfect. But instead of changing every year or two to something that just came out, forget that. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, it is. Music standards. Music standards. Uh, many churches, and we did uh, Understand the Times on this a few years ago, or a few months ago, uh, hymns have been eliminated or replaced with contemporary music and who knows what else. And uh, we haven't changed our music standard. Not only in 35 years I've been here, but before that, the church has maintained good, godly, God-pleasing music. And we could change our music and probably get more people to come. Most of us would leave, <laughs> but we have more people, perhaps, with different music. But uh, pragmatism in ministry is not, let's do it because it works, because it talks people. That's never a biblical standard. It's man's standard, but it's not a biblical approach to things. In the gospel preached, 
we've been very consistent. Um, there have been different gospels, or gospel messages and emphases. 1989, John MacArthur published a book called The Gospel According to Jesus, and that became the spearhead for the Lordship Salvation Gospel. You gotta accept Jesus as Lord in order to accept him as Savior. I do believe you, Jesus Christ is Lord, first of all, he's God, there's no question about that. Trust in Christ as Savior, then you obey him and live for him as your Lord, but not to become a Christian. We don't have to change how we live in order to become saved. The Lord changes us. That's what salvation is, new life. Old things are passed away. Other different gospels have been presented too through the years, but we've never followed those fads either. Stick with the gospel. And in the focus of our ministry, we're the same. Um, going way back to page one, preach the gospel, discipleship, seek to see souls saved, and grown up and matured in the Lord. Got a slide, uh, Charles Spurgeon, a uh, favorite guy. A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. And he would have spoken that 120 or whatever years ago. And that prophecy's come true, I think. A lot of goat pleasing in churches today. And I won't call anybody a clown to their face, but, but a lot of entertaining of goats, wanting to reach the world instead of evangelizing the, the gospel. The Apostle Paul said this, very similar, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. And there, that's the same thing that Spurgeon basically said, clowns entertaining the goats. And we don't need that. Thankfully, we've not gone those directions. There are churches that do a lot of things um, in the name of evangelism or whatever that I can't imagine God in heaven looking down and saying, well, that's, that's a good thing as we entertain goats. Final point, Open Door Baptist Church will soon have important decisions to make. We came here, I was 25. 25 plus 35 is 60. I'm an old man now. <laughs> and uh, so we have important decisions to make. What direction will the church go in the future? Um, if we had more time, I'd turn to these chapters, but just I'll summarize them in just a moment, in just a matter of a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The chapter ends. Perilous times will come. The world's going to get worse and worse. Evil men and seducers will get worse and worse. We just quoted chapter 4 in 2 Peter, 2 Timothy, itching ears. What our church needs to do, if we're going to be the same, enduring and faithful, continuing the things that was learned and has been assured. Don't change just because society's changing, culture's changing. You're not going to reach as many people if you don't change. God can reach people through anything. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God of salvation. The passion is not the power of God. The witnesses aren't the power of God. Entertainment is not the power of God. The gospel is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believes. Continue in what we've learned. And preach the word. Um, don't get sidetracked into all sorts of nonsense goes on in churches. Uh, we need to continue to preach the word. And if we're going to be a faithful and enduring church in the future, as we have been in the past, those two things. Continue where we've been and preach the word instead of whatever else.